precious you are to me, to me.
And yes, we do serve a mighty God. Today we're going to be in Philippians chapter 1, verse, uh, starting verse number 12. Hopefully I, I gave enough notice about that. I, I feel like the Lord enacted a change and I want to be cognizant of the Holy Spirit. Um, as you know, we've been doing Revelation and I mentioned that we're going to take a two or three um, it may wait till September, the first Sunday in September to start back. Not, not sure. I knew, and I mentioned last Sunday, I wanted to preach a message called The Struggle, and I knew that it would be probably a couple of Sundays, and it's, it's about spiritual warfare and the wrestling that we have in our spirit and soul over, over things of that nature. I was at a mission, a mission seminar. I got to spend some time with uh, Jeremy and Veronica and the boys um, Something they do. We're out in the middle of the plains of Texas, big camp out there, and um, we have a mission committee meeting for the World Baptist Fellowship and all that. Heard a message the first night, a friend of mine named Mike Evans. Mike has preached here. It's been a number of years ago, and just a great guy, pastored for many years, and then for a number of years he worked for Arlington uh, Baptist University, and uh, just just a good guy, and, and, and he preached a, a message, and, and as soon as the message was, says, Mike, says, man, I'd love to use that outline. Any similarity to uh, preaching that message would go out the door after the outline, but I'd love to use that outline. Could I have permission to use that? And he said, of course you can. And so uh, the Lord kind of laid things in place because he, next week we have Brother Danny Flowers and uh, uh, the message called The Struggle. I, of course, I wanted to be on successive Sunday. So now I've got you totally up to date on everything. We are in Philippians chapter 1. Ever remember the song? Um, they still sing it. Um, children's Church and Sunday School. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Um, where? Oh, yeah, you got it. You got it. We sang that song. And it, it, that's, that's, a, that's a principle of God's Word. And, and just the whole... Um, the book of Philippians and the backstory, the context of Paul's writing here uh, is, is tremendous. Philippians was a prison epistle. It's a book that doesn't how, tell you just how to survive when things are not as they seem to be or should be or just flat out when things are not good. Philippians a, a, is a book that teaches you not only how to survive but to have joy regardless of the circumstances. I think it addresses the mental and emotional goals we should have as they relate to the physical circumstances going on with us and, of course, the spiritual goals. When we think about the life of Paul, uh, what he went through, it really does provide for us some great teaching on how to have joy in our lives. And again, think of the setting. Someone teaching us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, how you can maintain a heart of joy. And I, I specifically gave this title to this message, How to Maintain a Heart of Joy. Now, hopefully, when you trusted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you do understand that you had something supernatural happen uh, to your soul and your spirit, and you you have joy as opposed to just ha not opposed to, but but better than happiness. And so, uh, in these verses here, I want to just kind of give you four things here. And again, thank Mike Evans for the outline. These four things: I need how to maintain a heart of joy. I need a perspective to live from, and the prepositions are kind of important here. I need a priority to live by, I need a power to live on, and I need a purpose to live for. They are contained in the book of Philippians. Let's, let's look, if you would, in verse number 12, where Paul, after his introductions and stuff, and, and of course, uh, Philippians 1.6 is a great, great verse, but we don't have time for that. He has begun a work in you. Um, uh, let, let's look at uh, verse number 12. But I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. 
Look at that phrase that in the King James, that the, king, that the things which happened unto me. What, well, what happened? What were the earthly circumstances that Paul was dealing with uh, at that moment? Well, he was writing this from prison. He had been arrested and he was in the custody of the mighty Roman Empire. Um, to be in a prison in Rome didn't engender much sometimes much hope of ever getting out or uh, much hope that it's just going to be a, a joy ride because it wasn't. Um, in Paul's case, he had been under house arrest. Uh, some of his prison terms, of course, we know from Acts, he had been under house arrest. He'd rested other times. And uh, uh, nonetheless, there are times when he was watched by, of course, uh, as an important prisoner, watched by Roman guards. Some believe, some scholars believe at times he was chained between two uh, Roman guards. Some say probably every four hours they rotated. That, that is possibly true and uh, different historians that we know. Uh, in other words, it was no picnic. Those were his circumstances, earthly circumstances. We all have them. If I were to ask you, how was your week? Some of you, if you were gut level honest, you might say, Pastor, it was a great week. It was a great week. Some of you might say, it was kind of a tough week. My car broke down, this, that, and the other. Um, we had to take the dog to the vet or somebody cussed me out. I mean, the earthly circumstances we endure on any given week are changing and they are variable depending on you, depending on others often. The earthly circumstance. Paul was in a situation where he was arrested, he was in jail, he was in prison, and maybe not knowing when he was going to get out. So that was the circumstances. Circumstances often, more than often, and often for some people, always dictate their happiness. Now, there are a couple of things that we need to remember. Happiness and joy are different. Now, they might have some of the same earmarks. We are happy if there's money in the bank and the car is running and nobody cussed us out and everything. Those are circumstances that produce, we call it happiness. Happiness is more external to me than internal. Joy is a different story. So... That was his earthly circumstance. What was his heavenly providence? Look, we, we said that the things which happened unto me, and then he said, have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. To put it more modern terminology you might say, but this ends up being a good thing for the gospel of Jesus Christ. How so, Paul? As Paul dissects in his mind just what was going on, he didn't focus on the fact that he wasn't out in the world preaching or traveling from church to church, which he loved to do, and meeting people, starting churches, revisiting churches, and all of that thing. He didn't moan about that God had miraculously delivered him from prison, which, by the way, that happened in Philippi in Acts chapter 16. Remember the little thing called an earthquake? Boom! The jail doors opened. They end up... Uh, 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 witnessing to the jailer who gets saved and his family gets saved and baptized. That had not happened. He, di he didn't moan about that. It is here that we see the perspective to live from. All of us, and this, this was written to the church at Philippi, all of us need a perspective in life to live from. In other words, to me, perspective is how you look at things. Now look at the first part of that verse, but I would that you should understand, brothers. So here's the perspective. I want you to understand that the things that happened unto me really is a good thing, is a good thing. Um, how can you, as a believer, have constant joy in your life? by realizing that God has a purpose behind every problem that comes your way. It isn't the amount of good and bad that comes your way that will give you joy. It is the way you look at it, the perspective, the good and the bad that comes your way. The perspective that they needed to understand was the difficult problem Paul was experiencing 
was actually good for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. In your life, when you get to the place and you get to the point in your life where you can look at everything that happens in your life with a proper perspective, a godly perspective, a good perspective, it will change your life lives. And so let's look at that. How, how did it? Paul goes on to explain. As you go to verse number 13 and you, you look at verse 13, it says, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. One of the things that he said, so the first thing that he said, how, how was this good? How was this? What, what is your perspective on me being in prison? Well, number one, a lot of Romans are getting saved. Now, historians allude to, Roman historians are probably not going to be as forthcoming about uh, Romans, uh, military, government, or otherwise, trusting Christ as Savior. But we do know, we do know that a number were saved. Uh, my, my friend uh, conjectured this at any time if Paul was indeed chain between two Roman prisoners and let's say they um, uh, switched every four hours for many of the times that he was in. He could have actually been able to give the gospel to approximately 4,000 soldiers, the gospel. That's how Paul looked at it. So uh, and, 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 and there, there, are, uh, there are some inklings that Nero had some in his government Killed. Of course, he killed some in his own family. Some even hint that was because he found out they became Christians. The point is, the heavenly providence was, I'm here so that people that are considered the enemy can be saved. You know what? God can snatch good out of the worst experiences in life. Amen. Secondly, Christians were getting bold. Look, if you would... Uh, and, and the next verse, some indeed, well, let me, let me back up, 14, some indeed, uh, no, verse 14, excuse me, and many of the brethren of the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So here's the second thing, perspective that happened. The Christians that, that know that I am in prison for my faith, it has emboldened them. They say, you know, we need to be more like Paul, who was more like Jesus. And they are witnessing, it in, in, a, in a strange sort of spiritual mix, God emboldened them to be able to witness and be a witness for Christ uh, all around them. That was the perspective, a second perspective that the Apostle Paul had. And then he even goes on and gives a little commentary about the preaching of the gospel and the sharing of Christ. Uh, and many of the brethren of the Lord waxed and conquered, read that, verse 15, some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill, the one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. Now, I'll kind of address the, the motives behind those preaching a little bit later, but suffice to say that the gospel was being preached uh, by a wide variety of Paul's detractors, Paul's people that love Paul, uh, but the gospel was being preached. So three things right there, uh, Christ was being preached, and that is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Uh, Alphonse Carr in a book called A Tour Around My Garden said this, we can complain because rose bushes have thorns, or we can rejoice because thorns have roses. Uh, one, one writer said this, I will love the light for it shows me the way, yet I will endure the darkness for it shows me the stars. We can look at life. Um, if, if you will honestly and transparently look at the things that have happened in your life, and, and you're, you're like me, there are circumstances that, that have happened to you. You've just handled completely wrong. I have completely wrong. But this I do know. There are circumstances where God has worked in my heart and I have by His grace and His power and His wisdom been able to say, you know, there's a reason this is happening. And, and, and it may not make things physically better or situations better, but it makes me better because I understand that there is a bigger plan. You say, so everything, 
But, you know, the Bible says in, in, in Romans 8, 28, we know all things work together for good to them who love God, to them who are the called according to, the pur- to His purpose. We know that that is still in Scripture. We, we know that's still in Scripture. All things. Someone, someone mentioned this. So, so you're telling me that the Holocaust, one of the most awful things in human history, something good came out of it? Well, no, no doubt evil was rampant. Uh, during that age. Six million plus Jews, uh, people were killed in the Holocaust. Horrible. And Frank had a perspective about it. Um, but you know what? That, that was a catalyst that many Jews, and I've met some who, who their parents stayed in Germany prior to World War II, and those that left and came to Israel in 1948, Israel was founded as a nation. Yes, God's plan is still working, as difficult as that may be to understand. So here's a practical, I call it perspective point. Everything that happens in our life, the good, the bad, the happy, the sad, should be viewed in light of eternity because Romans 8, 28 is still in Scripture. Number two, I need a priority to live by. Verse 18, what then? Notwithstanding, every way, whether in pretense or or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Now, this verse is kind of a capper uh, from verses uh, 13 through uh, uh, 17. Paul states that he is happy as long as Christ is preached, which means that the priority that he lived was by the message of the gospel of Christ and thus the preeminence of Christ. So it, it, was, it was more important that the gospel was being preached even though some that preached it didn't like Paul or they did it selfishly or they did it for whatever reason. Now God will one day judge all of us for the, the right and wrong reasons we serve the Lord. He will judge all of us. But, but Paul said, I care more that Christ is preached than being angry at those that don't like me. Um, that's because Christ was preeminent in his life. You know, we should have a pecking order in our life as to priority. What is the most important things that we should focus on as truly important? Not just what we think is important, but if we know that we know that we know that God indeed feels that they are important. And these aren't, these aren't Bible truths that are like museum pieces that we can admire and we can never be like that. That is not true. Paul got angry. Uh, Paul, Paul got tired. Paul went through a lot of good and bad examples in life. He was no different. The grace of God is just as much available for you as it is the Apostle Paul. And so uh, he knew that preeminence. He, he would write in Colossians uh, verse seven, 117, He is before all things, and by him do all things consist. Then in chapter 3, verse 2 of Colossians, he would say something like this, Set your affection on things above and not on things of the earth. Let me tell you something. If you get your priorities right in life, amazingly, there are things that will begin to fall in place. By being here today, by the way, let me give you some kudos here, uh, some shout outs, as they say. Uh, you being here today in church, you've, you've at least on some degree says, you know, church is important for me. It's important that I come and, 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 and worship the Lord. It's, it, Sunday is the day to worship God. This one hour that we have, one hour plus a few minutes, uh, that, that we have to come and worship the Lord uh, is, is, should be important in our lives. And so you've done a good thing by being here today. Um, now, what about Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday? They're going to come up in six or less days. And, and we should have priorities there that are Christ. Um, C.S. Lewis said um, he was greatly in love with his wife that died. Um, and he wrote a book called A Grief Observed. And he says, When I have learned to love God better than my earthly dearest, I shall love my earthly dearest better than I do now. When first things are put first, second things are not suppressed but increased. 
Um, so here's a practical priority point. Focus on what and who is truly important, even when it seems harder to do than what isn't as important. Matthew 6, 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added. And let me just give a personal here as, as a pastor. I don't always live by the priority that I preach, and God calls me on it, and I feel bad about it, and thankfully I repent of that. But I can tell you, when I start a day focused on the fact I'm going to give Christ honor today in my life. Everything that I do, I'm going to do my best. I will probably fail miserably during the day. But in my heart, I want to serve him today. And when I have done that, there have been times at night when I've laid my head on my pillow and look back and I go, Lord, you did exactly what you said you would in your word. Why don't I do that every day? And so... Uh, we need a priority to live by. Then number three, we need the power to live on. Verse 19, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Verse 20 was his goal, and verse 19 was his power to accomplish that goal. I need a power to live on. Now, many of you are bright. Many of you have money. Many of you here have influence in different realms in your life. And all that's well and good in its proper place. But for you to live a life of good and godliness, it's going to take way more than that. We cannot do it on our own. And often we, we try to do it on. You say, Pastor, I have none of those. Well, you know what? The level, uh, the field is level at the foot of the cross. And whatever you think or don't think about yourself, God has the power to use you in a mighty, mighty way. I've known super intelligent people that have wasted their life. In other words, their, their smarts got in the way of, of and, and it actually, their, their strength actually became a, a very bad weakness in their life. And then I've known people that uh, uh, felt uh, disenfranchised or, 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 or whatever, and they have trusted Christ as Savior. And they have put their faith in him. I've seen him use those people, church members, in mighty ways of, of God's blessing and power. I need a power to live on. Verse 19 shows the way. First of all, it is the power of prayer. In order to have the right perspective and the right priority, it takes power. The power to do what you know you should do and the power to perceive in the way things should be perceived. It takes something and it takes power that is not of this world. When we sincerely and humbly lift our hearts and our minds in prayer and worship, and we ask God, first we praise Him, we thank Him for who He is and what He does. We don't pray selfishly, but there is a part where God says, You can come to me, call unto me, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Jeremiah 33, 3. I can do that, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus in the book of Philippians. And so uh, a prayer. I was so blessed. Brother Russell came to me and said, you know, my class, which they were on spiritual warfare. Uh, he says, you know, they just want to know how we can do more to pray. And, and, and we talked a little bit about that, and there are other things that we can do officially and unofficially because prayer is important. But it, it, just, it, it just blessed my heart to hear that there was a desire for, for, for prayer uh, and how we can pray more. We saw that prayer power materialize in Acts 12 when Peter was in jail and the saints prayed and God mysteriously opened the cell door and Peter just walked right out. God can do those kind of things in your life. He can give you the words to say. He can give you the words not to say. He can, he can help you and bless you. And also that power to live on is the supply of the Spirit. It is the Spirit of God. Jesus is 
in heaven on the throne making intercession for our sin according to Hebrews chapter 7 verse number 22 ever making intercession for us. He gives us the Holy Spirit uh, which works in us, which is God in us. Uh, uh, It is the power pipeline we need to have right there in that pew before seconds before I walked up here I said I pray that the Holy Spirit would anoint the message today and, and, and it would speak to the heart of somebody here and it would glorify God. That's a simple prayer that is simply heard by a magnificent God. Uh, Louis Gigolo, of which we had a study, Brother Carney, uh, Don't Let the Enemy Have a Seat at Your Table. Psalm 20 was an awesome title for that. I'd, I'd listen just for the title. Um, uh, he, he said this, I want my life to defy human explanation. The great radio Bible teacher Woodrow Kroll said this, with the power of God within us, we never we need never fear the powers around us, which leads me to a practical power point. Our confidence in life rests in the power of Christ. Uh, chapter 4, verse 13, let's repeat it with me. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And so we have that. Um, I need a perspective to live from, a priority to live by, a power to live on, and finally, I need a purpose to live for. Very simple verse. We highlighted it in one slide in our Bible reading. For me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. In one, listen to me, in one simple, succinct sentence, Paul declared his purpose to live as Christ and to die is gain. As a matter of fact, we see all the points in this message kind of hidden in that verse. His perspective in life on earth is Christ, and death is gain. We see priority, which is Christ. He's preeminent. We see power of Christ, which also gives him purpose. I need a purpose to live for. Um, You weren't put on earth to be remembered. You were put here to prepare for eternity. Um, Someone has once said that for a man to be happy, he needs someone to love, something to believe in, and something to look forward to. We have all that in a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you are pouring all your happiness into one individual, it uh, doesn't matter who it is, if it's a spouse, a child, a father, a mother, uh, uh, just a revered friend, or even your pastor they are going to disappoint you at some point. They are going to disappoint you. But Jesus Christ will never, ever disappoint you in this life. And so, and when we do that, we will live for Christ and others. Someone said, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. Humility is thinking more of others. And when you do that, you will be able to minister more completely to others. And so when I think of the unbelievable mistakes and sins I've committed in my life, I can get very depressed. But if I live with the purpose that I was put here for, it brings me joy to know that my past isn't an anchor to hold me back. It can be a compass to drive me forward. Purpose. What is purpose? It's doing on this planet in this life, however many years you have, it's doing what God created you for. And let me tell you something. When you center on that and you know that you are here for this reason and it is a God-given reason that by the Spirit of God is confirmed in your heart. That's, that's heaven. That is heaven. That is, I'm part of his plan. I, my little speck of humanity on this planet and in the space-time continuum, I, I'm part of that plan. I, I, I've told you again and again the moment I had in Ecuador, back of a pickup truck, Mel, Neil driving like a madman. I've had my headphones on, I'm listening to the voice of truth by casting crowns and Pastor Bronson of White House Baptist, he's in the back seat just trying to hold on for dear mercy. 
that song came on. I had one of those moments. Carrie, you're doing, you're doing what you were meant to do in this life. And I'm telling you, it's, it's euphoria. It's, it's nirvana, the right nirvana. It's the God nirvana. And so a practical purpose point is live and look at life in light of eternity and you will live with purpose. Brother Mike said this. He said, every moment of your life, if you can focus and, and live in that present moment for eternity, it will make a difference in your life. Philippians 4, 13 and 14 says, says that uh, I forget what's behind me. I press toward what's for. I look for the prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And, and Josh, you can go ahead and put that back up there. Uh, we, we also knew this. As a teenager, I learned this acrostic. Joy is Jesus first, others next, yourself last. That doesn't mean you're not important to God. But if you go in that pecking order, life itself will be in place.